From the throne of grace, O God of mercy, at the hour your Son gave himself to death, hear the devout prayer of your people. As he is lifted high upon the cross, draw into his exalted life all who are reborn in the blood and water flowing from his open side. Through Jesus Christ, our Passover and our peace, who lives and reigns with you now and always in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper, and he shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the sons of man, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths before him, for that which has not been told to them they will see, and from which they have not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before the Lord like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we counted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Each has turned to their own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord.
refrain of our psalm is, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord.
the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. After they had eaten their supper, Jesus sent out, went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where was a garden, which he had with his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met, met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers, together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these others go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of these men's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciple and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priests? If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ere Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment, the cock crowed. They took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. 
Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and judge him according to your law. They replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. So you are a king? You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. What is truth? After he had said this, Pilate went out to the Jews again and told them, I found no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they, and they dressed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, king of the Jews. And they snuck and they struck him on the face, Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I found no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. They answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? You would have no power over me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the stone, the stone pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for Passover, and it was about noon. Pilate said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to a to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many people read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. 
Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scriptures, saying, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And now, and that, excuse me, and that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cloapa, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, in order to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of fear of of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave his permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had a first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, weighing about a hundred weight. They took the body of Jesus, and they wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, And in the garden, there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there.
today is about something uh, deep and primordial in Christian spirituality. What most distinguishes Christians, fa Christian faith from others is Good Friday, a crucified God. That's beyond comprehension. There are no words. We fall silent. On Good Friday, we're invited to contemplate the mystery, to be loving, lovingly present, and to allow the death of Jesus to shape our way of being engaged with the pain and suffering that's all around us in the world and with our own pain and suffering. The passion of Christ is lived out daily by millions of people all over the world. We keep them in mind as we meditate on the scripture readings. These words from the fourth song of the suffering servant in the book of the prophet Isaiah are so intimately connected with Good Friday. He had no form or majesty, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. By his bruises, we are healed. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah presents the suffering servant as one who shared the suffering and sorrow of God's people in exile. Eventually, the suffering servant became larger than life, a symbol of Israel's hope for a Messiah who would restore them to their land. As the early Christian community meditated on this suffering servant of Isaiah, they recognized in this prophetic figure, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for our salvation. Good Friday also brings a, a flood of other images from the passion narratives, the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, the way of the cross. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, I think especially of that painting with Jesus in the foreground leaning on a big rock with the city of Jerusalem in the background. Jesus chained to a pillar, his body twisted and bleeding, face agonized as the soldiers scourge him. Jesus crushed under the weight of the cross. Jesus standing before the crowd, flogged, clothed in purple, crowned with thorns, a reed in his hand. Ecce homo, behold the man. The dead body of Jesus in the arms of his mother. Jesus crucified. And this image is so varied from the bleeding, tortured, desperate man crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? to the regal, victorious Son of God who proclaims it is finished and freely gives up his spirit. Jesus, the suffering servant. Jesus, lifted up on the cross. Jesus, the savior of the world. Sink into the mystery of a crucified God. We keep coming back to the suffering of Jesus. We keep focusing on the crucified Christ because we truly believe, some would even say we know, that by his bruises we are healed. As we contemplate Jesus revealed in all those Good Friday images and words, we discover again that there is more here than might be expected. We focus on Christ crucified because there we hope, we find hope in our own suffering and in the suffering of the world. 
we find that the song of the suffering servant is actually a love song, a song of God's crazy, passionate love for his people. It's almost amazing, it's wonderful, it's true. The suffering and death of Jesus are different. By suffering and dying, Jesus, the Son of God, brought an end to the tyranny of suffering and death. Suffering and death are no longer what they were. They are transformed by the suffering and death of Jesus. As on every Good Friday, we gather in grief to remember the suffering and death of Jesus. We fix our sorrowing and stunned gaze on the broken, dead body of Jesus. But there is more. With his last breath, the Spirit of God was let loose in the world, free to seep into every crevice and corner of the universe. The resurrection has begun as Jesus' blood seeps into the earth and his breath disappears into the air. Having gathered in grief, we will depart in silence today. Jesus is dead. It is finished. Now's the time of loss and emptiness, the in-between time between death and resurrection. The seed is in the ground, and with time it will sprout and break forth from the tomb and burst into bloom. So even as we grieve, it's tinged with hope. What could have remained hideous, a painful memory to be suppressed, is mysteriously transformed into beauty and hope. But we cannot simply close the tomb and depart, because God hasn't finished the story yet. In Jesus, God makes suffering redemptive. Suffering and death, which is thoroughly, radically, and consistently for God and for others, has the power to transform things and people and situations. Strange as it sounds, suffering is an extraordinary power that is bestowed on us. Think about this change, this transformation. We can all relate to the suffering and death of Jesus because that's clearly our experience and our lot as well. But the transformation of suffering and death might not be so much a part of our experience. Let's just focus a moment on how or why the suffering and death of Jesus changed suffering and death. First of all, as the fourth song of the suffering servant already hints, it is God's work. We do not transform suffering and death. God does. It was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain, we heard, so that he might also prolong his servant's days and make him prosper. My servant shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. God, as we know and believe, raised Jesus from the dead. But suffering and death are also transformed because of the way Jesus suffered and died. Only through accepting and bearing, enduring suffering, entering into it, in some cases even embracing it, did Jesus overcome and conquer suffering. In the words of the fourth song of the suffering servant, he poured out himself to death. Jesus lived and died so thoroughly, radically, consistently for God and for us that in him death comes under God's power, serves God's ends. 
Richard Rohr suggests in a meditation, don't get rid of pain until you've learned its lessons. When you hold the pain consciously and trust fully, you are in a very special liminal space where you have the possibility of breaking through to a deeper level of faith. Hold the pain of being human until God transforms you through it. Then you won't pass on the pain. Instead, you'll be an instrument of transformation for others. And yet, as Anne Weems says in her poem, fair is fair. We still don't like the way it was done. The whole idea of a sacrificial lamb is not to our liking. What's fair is fair, and there was no justice here. The innocent one, the righteous one, the holy one, put to death because the ones in charge of politics wanted to hold on to their crowns, and the ones in charge of religion wanted to hold on to the keys to the church. How could they do it? The Good Friday Liturgy of the Word concludes with the solemn intercessions. Let us pray, dearly beloved, for the Holy Church of God, that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Almighty and ever-living God, in Christ your Son, you revealed your glory to all nations. Safeguard the great work of your mercy, that your church through the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for our most holy Father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church, to govern the holy people of God. Almighty and ever-living God, whose wisdom orders all things, protect with your love the shepherd you have chosen, that the Christian people you entrust to his care may under his leadership prosper in faith. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our Bishop Peter, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, and for the whole of God's faithful people. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose spirit the church is sanctified and governed, hear the prayers we offer for those you have called to ministry and for your entire people, 
that by your grace we may all serve you faithfully. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of God's mercy, that having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty and ever-living God, by whom the Church is continually blessed with new members, deepen the faith and understanding of all catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may take their place among your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and to keep them in his one church. Almighty and ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated to you may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that God may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to the covenant. Almighty and ever-living God, who long ago chose Abraham and his descendants and established them as children of the promise, hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty and ever-living God, Grant that those who do not believe in Christ, but who walk before you in sincerity of heart, may find the truth. And may we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God. Almighty and ever-living God, you implanted in the heart such a deep longing for yourself that only in you can peace be found. Grant that despite the obstacles which stand in the way, all may recognize the signs of your goodness, discern the holiness of your people, and so gladly acknowledge you as the one true God and Father of all. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for true peace and the freedom of all. Almighty and ever-living God, whose hand upholds the rights and aspirations of all, guide those in authority that people everywhere on earth may enjoy prosperity, freedom of religion, and the security of peace. 
through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that God may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty and ever-living God, comfort of mourners and the afflicted, strength of the weary and those who toil, hear the prayers of all who cry to you in any tribulation, and grant that they all may rejoice because your mercy attended them in their hour of need. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You can be seated as we prepare for the adoration, veneration of the cross. The collection for the places in the Holy Land takes place now. I forgot that. Where's the cross? Oh, there it is. Okay. There's no hurry there, taking up the collection. You know, we have the uh, mission booze downstairs <coughs> now. So there's actually uh, about 30 or 40 extra servings there if anyone wants to come down and get it.
please stand. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. The choir is going to come up first uh, for the veneration of the cross so that they can be singing through the rest of it. And then we ask you to come up the double file down the center aisle, the center sections first, and then the outside sections. Did I get that right? Yes. Good. <laughs>
The communion ministers can come forward, please. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. The body of Christ, the body of Christ, Judy, the body of Christ, James. The hymn during communion is number 945. The body of Christ, what your wife is in. Anne Marie, the body of Christ, Dawn. The body of Christ, Betty, right.
Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Ah, <laughs> there's an announcement. Uh, Fish and brews is the announcement. Uh, it's, they're available uh, downstairs now for those who are interested. And there, I've been told there are extra ones, so even if you weren't expecting to have fish and brews, maybe you will. <laughs>